Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We got Monica and Lee and Lisa. Hello, Lenny. Always good to see you. Let me do a share screen and we'll get my PowerPoint up. All right. So pretty timely, this class, uh, given the uh, changes in the market. I was talking to an agent yesterday and she's had a listing on the market for 40 days uh, and not getting a lot of showings. Had an open house, did have some people through. So uh, kind of, you know, what are you guys seeing out there? What's happening in your, in your perspective as far as the market? Are we hearing chatter? Nate put a great, Nate did a great video and a great uh, post. It was either this morning or yesterday that uh, we marry the house, but we date the interest rate, right? So it's a great way to put it. So because as soon as the interest rates come down, people are going to refi, right? I was talking to a coaching client yesterday and she said, we're in a future refinance market. Uh, and so what are you guys seeing out there as far as the chatter? Any, any comments, any, any conversations with buyers or sellers? Yeah, I'll chime in, Sarah. Yeah. Um, so I recently put in, put a house on the market. Well, I shouldn't say recently, like 60 days ago. It was before we had our first crazy interest rate, you know, increase. And, um, and I put it on the market at kind of like pretty much, it was pretty spot on. I, I don't want to say it was like over, under, whatever. It was pretty spot on. So like, and it was priced at 695 in the first three days I got an offer cash offer at 680 and of course it was like oh it's like the first offer and we'll we'll counter them so I did counter at 690 um and then we went in and out of it didn't get accepted in and out of contract with, with other buyers and then finally this same guy came back 60 days later offered 660 cash quick close as is and they took it so wow, yeah, that's kind of what's happening. But I think I'm also seeing that um, agents, listing agents are pricing them, continuing to price higher, like mm -hmm. as if the market's still going up. And I'm working with a, a buyer right now. And I had a conversation with the agent and he's like, well, I'm the lowest in the neighborhood. And I'm like, yeah, I agree. You're the lowest in the neighborhood because there's a lot of other, you know, listings that are sitting on the market. I said, but you're still priced 20 grand over what the last sold comp was that was in May. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anyway, we're going to put in an offer on that one today. It's probably not going to go anywhere because my client's not offering full price. Right, right. Yeah. Because, you know, she's, she's scared. She's like, the market's going, turning down. Why would I offer that? Well, I don't know if the market is necessarily turning down. I think that it's correcting itself. I think that well, prices yeah. prices prices have been really bloated. Um, you know, you're talking about 23% year over year um, increase nationally, and I think Arizona was like 25%. Uh, so you just it, it there has to be a correction there, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and one thing, one thing I think I would definitely let your people know, not that it necessarily applies to her personally, but mm -hmm. it does affect the, the market is that four out of 10 homes are owned free and clear. And so when we talk about having a crash, right, right. If, if homes home, own free and clear, it's impossible, right? So when we just are, we got to, we've got to manage people's expectations, right? And I think that's why this class is timely is that we got sellers out there that haven't caught up, right? Right. That think the market's still, still this, and it's still robust. I mean, you guys, we only have 13,000 active homes on the market and that's not even necessarily single family in Phoenix. That's mm -hmm. all of the, that's all of armless. Um, and so we still have, we still have, you know, we're still a long way away from being balanced. Right. And I think it's right. just going to, it's going to take a minute for the consumers to, to catch up to this. And I think it's going to take a minute for realtors to catch up with it because someone who comes into your pipeline 30 days from now, they're not even going to know that the interest rates were 2.75, you know, six months ago. They're not going to know that. They're going to say, what's the rate today? And how do we navigate that? All right. So I think right. we have to, we have to be good stewards of our messaging too. Um, and, and, you know, letting people know, like, what are the positives here? Um, and I think like Nate said, is we, we date, we marry the house, but we date the interest rate. So, um, so this class is all about pricing and I'm well, there's a bunch of scripts and dialogues in each, in each section that we probably won't get to just because of time today. Um, but I do want to cover the seven steps. And then this allows you, because this is a trademark, um, 
a trademarks concept, you can actually use it in your marketing. So you can use that the, you're using a seven step proven uh, marketing and I'll, I'll give you the exact language. So definitely use that to your advantage because your competition isn't right. Uh, so we'll jump in with that. Any other, before I do that, any other comments from anybody? Everybody's good. Okay. All right. So, well, good luck, Lisa, on your listing <laughs> or on that buy side. So let's hope you get it, get it together. Uh, so pricing perspective. So this is on page three. So if you guys want to open your materials, you should have that in your email from me. Um, and I would like you to read uh, these paragraphs and then we're going to have a little conversation about it. We had somebody just jump in on an iPhone. If you'll tell me who you are, I can send you the class materials. Hi, this is Tanya. Hey, Tanya, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> no worries. Let me send you the class materials. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so hopefully you guys had enough time to read that. Let's go ahead and have a little bit of a dialogue. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of things in these in these paragraphs that I think are pretty powerful um, because our thoughts matter, right? And how we how we view the world. And so if we talked a little bit about that last week is your perspective, right? So your success as a listing agent has everything to do with your value proposition. And I think with the market, the market. And I, I think I, I like what Nate said in his Friday email is, is to stop saying it's shifting, right? Because is that going to imply something negative, right? And so I think the words of it's returning to a pre-COVID, pre-pandemic pre, pre uh, balanced market, right? It's a, we're moving into more of a balanced market instead of such a, a frenzy. And again, we still don't have enough inventory. Um, one thing uh, real quick before I forget, um, I would encourage all of you guys to look at builders for spec inventory. Um, I closed on a Taylor Morrison and the neighborhoods over off of baseline and 51st Avenue on Friday. And I was looking at the MLS and they had several spec homes and they're offering a decent commission and also a 3% incentive to a buyer, which we haven't seen that from builders in the last almost three years. And so how could that, you, know, you could use that Monica to buy down an interest rate you know, use those three, that 3% because it's, it's an incentive, right? To, for the buyer to use however they want to. So you could use it to buy down the rate. So I would pay attention to that. Um, Nate has brought this up before, but there could be some uh, really awesome uh, new build opportunities out there because people have been waiting. This guy waited 16 months to have this house built um, and we closed without appliances, which was crazy to me. <laughs> uh, never done that before. Uh, so so uh, there's, you know, there's people out there that have been waiting and because the rates went up, it's bumped them out. So, and, and the homes are there. So I would be, I would be paying attention to that. And I have also heard uh, from a couple of you guys that, that we're seeing some 4% uh, offers from builders out there. So they want us back. Um, okay. So go back to the materials. Sorry. I, I, that popped in my head. I want to make sure I shared that with you. So if the seller perceives more value, right, they need to see the value that you bring to the table. And we, we can't overlook the, the small details, such as making a key for the lockbox, right? That's a detail that the seller doesn't think about, but that's a part of our job, right? Um, and so getting winnowing down to the smallest details to let them know, Lenny, exactly what you're going to do when you list that home. Um, Frank Russo had come up with a thing many years ago. If you guys want it, send me an email and I'll send it to you. Um, it was like 110 things that happens when we list your home. And it's pretty powerful to put that in front of someone because when you're sitting across the table, Lee, and you're asking someone for X apples and you slide that document in front of them and say, I'm not just any average Joe, right? This is what I'm going to do for you. And, and realtors who have not, this doesn't apply to any of you. Well, Lenny, uh, but the realtors that have been in the business less than five years, they're in for a rude awakening, right? Because you can't just stick a sign up or put a house in the MLS or whisper in a Starbucks and get multiple offers. And so um, it, it, we, we have to go back to doing our jobs uh, to actually market and expose homes. 
Uh, so what, so look at this to, to determine the co what constitutes value in the eyes of the seller, you need to find, we need to find out like, what is it that they need? And they're, they're reaching out to you because they have one, one goal and that's to sell their home. Um, so then the second paragraph is that homes sell for two reasons, price and exposure. And I love that because a lot of times, especially newer agents, they gravitate more towards buyers because they're intimidated by listings. But in reality, listings are easier. You make more money, right? On, on average, you spend five to six hours on a listing. Um, on a buy side, you're looking at 25 hours. And so easily 25 hours when you think about showing and, and having to write multiple offers, attending home inspections, all that stuff. So when we look at listings, you actually make more money per hour and your return on investment is stronger. So work towards getting those listings because you don't need a big marketing budget. You have the MLS, right? You have access to professional photography that is reasonably priced, you know, hundred bucks for professional photography. Uh, and then if you do a good job putting it in the MLS and using the MLS as your tool and it's priced right, that's the exposure that you need. Okay. Um, and then marketing should be a part of the plan in the third paragraph, right? We want to tell the seller exactly what it is that we're doing to get, to expose that home to the biggest buying pool. You guys, as Remax agents, we have seven days of free AdWorks ads that, that, that you can run, uh, which run automatically actually. And if you put your seller's information in there, it will show up in your seller's uh, Google searches. They get an email with all the times it's been viewed, it makes you look really good. So you have that. And then you have Megaphone, which Megaphone is a great tool as well. And I believe if somebody, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you get seven days of free Megaphone ads as well that you can push out to your social media. And so you have those two, two awesome tools to help expose the properties that are unique to you as a Remax agent. And then the last paragraph is, um, do we emphasize, the question is, do we emphasize price or exposure? And so before we decide that, we need to ask the question, are you a good marketer, right? Do you know how to market the home? And if, you know, you, you, you look at what Nate does, right? He's probably one of the best marketers that we have. And so asking yourself and then and going beyond that is, am I a good pricing strategist, right? Do I study the market? Do I know what's going on? I was poking around in the MLS the other day, just, just looking um, at some, some prices of properties that were lower price points. And what I found was curious is I saw some commission changes uh, which I was excited to see. Um, and then, you know, just seeing different um, price reductions. There's been a ton of price reductions. Uh, and so seeing, seeing that stuff and studying that, studying what's happening in the market, knowing those different sectors that are out there. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody yesterday from the Michigan market, and they said they're, you know, you still buy a house for hundred grand in Michigan. <laughs> and so, so they were saying that the lower price point stuff is still very robust, but the higher end stuff is sitting a little bit longer. So being a pricing strategist means that we study all of that, right? We're aware of what's happening with those trends. Um, and then it, again, there's trends within each neighborhood, right? Um, and it, being able to sit down with a seller and explain that. Um, and I also think it's important that and I shared this before, but I think it's important that you guys go to those iBuyer sites, right? Pay attention to what Redfin is saying the house is worth or Zillow because the consumer is. And so I shared with you guys um, that I got tripped up on that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and I was the guy, I had no clue that the guy even knew that that about open door and offer pad and these companies are out there. And he went and got himself a, an offer, which was, um, it was 245. And I was suggesting I had brought him an investor offer at 175. So those numbers were pretty far off, right? And so I had to educate him about how, you know, that's probably not a legitimate, legitimate offer once they see the house and they get in to, you know, do their inspections. So, um, but don't get caught up like I did because I was completely blindsided by the fact that I didn't even think that he would go uh, look at those, those options. So make sure you're paying attention to it, right? Because they are, okay? Um, all right, so the next slide here is one of, you know, how momentum works is your attitude, right? Mind your mind. So we have some core beliefs that you guys, you probably, some of you have seen these already, uh, but they are sprinkled throughout all of our momentum classes because core beliefs are important. So just take 30 seconds and read through those and then we're gonna, we'll talk about them a little bit more. All right. 
So let's come off mute and uh, tell me what you guys think about these core beliefs. Anything stand out to you? Any of them really resonate or make you uncomfortable? Everybody's in witness protection today. <laughs> I think overall, I would agree with them, okay. <clears throat> but sometimes just thinking about some of the sellers I've worked with, um, the, the intelligent part, the logical part, <laughs> sometimes seems to escape them because all they see is that my neighbor's house sold for that, mm -hmm. and that's what I want. And even when or, you point out to them the dip, why, why their house shouldn't sell for that. Right. Or I have this, um, this feature, right? Like solar or whatever it is, right? These upgrades that I did makes my house better. Um, I put a new roof on, so <laughs> I should get more money. Right. Right. Um, yeah. What about five and six? Do you guys know the difference between what's value versus price? So value is what a buyer is willing to pay. Right. And then the seller determines the price, but, but number five is the most important because what is the buyer willing to pay? Right. And, you know, uh, with with interest rates going up, you're going to have you're going to have a, a demand issue. Right. Which is then going to naturally law of law of physics. Right. Is that prices will come down. So uh, let's see. Um, number 12, there's a difference between taking listings and selling listings. I think that that's going to be even more important uh, right now as we, you know, I was talking to somebody yesterday, I think it was Roberta, actually, Monica said you guys had like six listings or something, um, which I was like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> Haven't heard that in a little while. So it doesn't do us any good, right, to take an overpriced listing and then have it sit there for six months, suck our resources and our energy, and then it not sell, right? Um, and we've talked about this before. If you get into a situation where you like each other and you're just a little bit off on price, then do an appraisal, you know, have an appraiser come out and then, um, you know, reimburse them when we get an offer, right? Uh, once it sells, you can reimburse them for that. Uh, and again, number 14, home sell for two reasons, price, price and exposure. Um, it's unacceptable to leave the seller's money on the table. And I think that's an important vibe that we must possess um, because it removes that creepy used car salesman that we only want to, you know, sell them the most expensive car so we can get paid the biggest, the biggest paycheck, right? And so, um, and then our case is that we sell it fast so that we can get paid quickly. And so I think that's an important vibe to make sure that you, you have that right because it builds immediate trust with people and of course number 17 tangible tools trump all opinions and so you know bob that's where we have to come back when they're not being logical is we have to come back and say hey people have lived before us right which is is one of the uh the scripts in here and and we could look at expired and ex, uh, canceled to say, this is what people have tried before in the past and it hasn't worked. And I think also paying attention to um, the details. When you look at comps, our job when we're running comps is discover why that home sold and why it sold for the price that it did. And so when we look at the data, we're not just looking at what did it sell for, but you need to go to the, the, the finance section and look at what kind of financing was it? Was there seller concessions? How many price reductions did they take? And what was the days on market? That's all relevant information to find. And so when I was looking at the, the stuff in that Tierra Montana neighborhood, um, I found the 3% uh, concession. And so that was a trend that was with all of their specs and with two different builders in that neighborhood. And so that's a trend that I love seeing coming back, right, uh, for people. And so, um, you know, we want to make sure we're paying attention to those trends. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, all right. So think of it this way. So why, what do sellers want? They want you to sell their house, right? They want to have the, the promise that's made that we're going to be able to sell their home. And why a home sell? Because we've priced them right and they're exposed properly. Um, and if they're in the MLS, that's the biggest and baddest tool that you guys have access to, to expose properties. Um, and then 40% of homes now, I don't think that number is accurate. It's about 25% in our market, even in a, in a, even in a hot market, you guys, if you, if you look at how many canceled listings, uh, one particular company has, and it's pretty staggering how many listings fail to sell, um, in their window of time. So, uh, so about 25% in our market failed to sell. And that's because agents didn't do a good job pricing them. And maybe there's a condition issue or a location issue. And both of those objections can be overcome with price. 
I remember we sold during the REO days, we sold a house, Tanya, you might remember this house, uh, out, it was literally had a view of the nuclear power, power plant. And I remember when we got that listing, I was like, no one's going to buy this. Right. But someone bought it. It only sold for like $15,000, but someone bought it. Um, and so, you know, price, <laughs> price can trump <laughs> location. Right. Uh, so if homes are priced inappropriately, cause I think agents just want to take the listing and they have a hard time trying they have a hard time being honest with sellers. Um, and then who determines the price? The seller ultimately does. And what I want to teach you guys in this class is not only the seven steps, but how do we lead a seller to be responsible and take accountability for pricing the house properly, right? Because there's only so much we can do at the end of the day, they determine where they're going to list the price. Um, and then do they have access to the MLS. No, they don't. Um, and so why are, why are homes priced incorrectly? Well, because we failed to effectively advise them. And, and I love the phrase, and we talked about this last week, is the appropriate price entry point. Where is the appropriate price to enter the market, right? And, and how, how effective are we going to be at exposing that home? And you know, we all agree that the first 30 days is the most critical time that a home's on the market. Um, and the National Association of Realtors says for every 10 showings that you have, you should get an offer. So if you've gotten more than 10 showings and no offer, that's pretty, in, pretty, pretty telling that it's overpriced, right? if you're getting no showings at all, that definitely could be a challenge too. Um, I think that I wouldn't, you know, when you're dealing, you know, Lisa or even Monica, you know, I know you have a listing that's been sitting on the market. I think we can't not panic right now, right? Don't panic. Don't get in that mode of like, oh my God, um, it's going to take a minute for the consumer to adjust to the interest rate. And hopefully the feds haven't swung the pendulum too far the other way. Um, so I think it's going to take a minute. And I think it's our job to make sure that we keep everybody breathing and not panicking. Um, because it, 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 when I first started selling real estate, it took 64 days to get your first offer. And I say your first offer because you might not take that offer. <laughs> and so, so we all need to just breathe a little bit and know that it might take 30 days. It might take 60 days or 90 days for a house to sell. And that's okay. That's okay. Right. So managing the seller's expectations and our own expectations. Right. Um, and I still think things that are priced under, you know, 450, 400, those things are still going to be selling very quickly. Um, agents fail to effectively lead sellers to an appropriate price entry point because they lack knowledge, right? They don't study the market. They lack confidence because they don't study the market and they, they lack judgment. So what's the role? And we want to change, change our, our languaging is that you're an advisor, right? You're an advisor to come in and give them the data that they don't have access to. Um, and, you know, they do have access to things like Zillow and Redfin and, th you know, places like that, that they didn't have 20 plus years ago. So we want to determine, we want to justify the value for the entry point. What determines the value? So we're going to talk about features, amenities, condition of the subject home, and then what justifies the, the what determines and what justifies the value are the solds, right? The solds and the expired. So we want to compare apples to apples if we, if we, at all possible times. So what do I mean by that? If we don't want to use a two-story to compare to a single level, right? Because a single level costs more to build, more concrete, more roof tile, and it's more desirable um, versus a two-story home. And so we want to try to compare as closely as we can. So uh, what determines the entry point? The current market trends, what's happening in the trends, um, and then what justifies the entry point? So these are the features, amenities, and condition of the active homes. So what's your competition? Um, it's curious driving around because I'm starting to see you know, more signs pop up, right? More signs, and you're like, oh, that house is for sale. Ooh, right? And so, uh, so paying attention, to those trends, what's happening? Um, what's the, what's the competition? And you know, Lisa had shared that one of the she's writing a house, uh, an offer on a house that the guy said, "Well, I'm the cheap, cheapest price in the neighborhood." Well, that might be the case, but you still might be overpriced, even though you're the cheapest property. Um, all right, so it, life is too short and the costs are too high to be in a relationship with unreasonable seller, sellers. And we talked about this last week is know your walkout price. Know when it's not gonna be in a relationship that you wanna be in. <laughs> um, if you've been in this business a minute, uh, you, I've, I've taken listings that have not sold, right? Six months on the market and the seller don't wanna do price reductions and they didn't sell. And so that was not fun to waste all that time, energy and resources on properties that didn't sell. 
Um, so sellers will trust and follow what you can logically and tangibly explain. I'm on page seven of the materials if you're following along. Um, is it better to tell a seller or have them self-discover? Self-discovery is the better choice because that is accountability, right? That's them taking leadership and responsibility for how we price the property. Um, and then what the, the change the perspective by providing unique, logical, and proven strategies. And so I also want to change your verbiage here of saying, I'm going to do a listing presentation. And the concept we teach in momentum is that we're having a dialogue versus a monologue, right? So instead of you telling the seller what to do, we want to get the seller to agree, right, uh, with what the facts are, right? Because again, tools or, or facts trump opinion. And so we want to facilitate a conversation using a, um, a complete pricing strategy. That is the way to lead a seller down a logical path of self-discovery. Now, um, if it's someone I know, um, I'm going to email comps ahead of time because I want them to look at the pictures. I want them to read the descriptions. I want them to see what's happening with that. If someone I don't know, I'm not going to do that because I don't know if they're interviewing other agents. I don't want them, the agents using that against me. Um, so because your competition will. Right. And I'm also probably not going to leave the comps with them. I'll leave other things, marketing materials, but I'm not going to leave my my comps because, again, if Lisa comes in behind me and sees my comps, she's going to use that against me, right? Because she wants the listing. Um, and I think that's important to find out. You've got to ask that question if they're interviewing other agents, because then you can strategically pick if you're a strong closer, go in first, right? If you want to be go in last, right? And then you know, be, be the closer on that too. But I like to go in first. And here's my my dialogue, Lenny, is that, I, you know, if they say, well, we have other appointments with, you know, a couple other agents, that's okay. I'll call them for you and cancel those appointments because they they feel embarrassed, right? They don't want to waste that. You know, they don't want to, they don't want to cancel and, and hurt the other person's feelings. Well, let me take that responsibility for you. Right? I'll do that for you. And I've been on both the giving and the receiving end of that phone call. <laughs> So, so, you know, offer to do it for them. So that if that's a closing technique that's going to get them to sign the listing with you tonight, then do it, right? Um, and so we want, so on page seven, the unique versus typical, we want sellers uh, to, they expect the help, right? They expect you to come in and tell them what's happening with the market, right? Um, but the, the same, in the seller's eyes, all agents are the same. Right. Years ago, there was a commercial, it was a lending commercial, and the husband and wife are getting into bed. And they're like, oh, so good that we picked the lender. And I feel really good about that choice. And then as they're about to go to sleep, the wife goes, oh, but what about the realtors? And they fly down the stairs and they open the back door and the flip on the light. And there's all these realtors with their business cards. Pick me, pick me, pick me. Right. And I hated that commercial. <laughs> Glad it's not on the TV anymore because it implies exactly what we're talking about here is that the seller, the consumer thinks that we're all the same. And Lisa, you are not the same as Tanya. Lenny, you are not the same as Lee, right? We're all different and we, we possess unique gifts and abilities and unique things that we bring to the table. And so we have to let that seller know that we're different, right? Um, and so how do we separate that? So we have to use logic, right? And, and unique and a proven strategy. So, um, and again, you guys, you get to use that TM after this class. So we need to consider the features and amenities of and condition of the current home, right? The solds, the expired and canceled. We haven't had to do that in a minute because the market's been so robust. Um, I think we probably should have always been doing it, but we haven't had to. So I think that's going to be a part of what you're polling, right? Is looking at those expired properties. Who has tried and failed, right? What are the seller's needs? What do they owe on the property? What are their needs as far as where they're going? Um, what are the trends and conditions of the area? Um, we're lucky that most of the properties we're selling, unless you're out, you know, selling land in the country, most of what you're selling is going to be in a neighborhood that is very specific, right? And your master plan communities, the builders are very specific about, you know, this is this product in this neighborhood, this product in this neighborhood in the overall master, master community. Um, and then we want to look at the active homes and then what's the seller's time? Um, I think that's going to be a real conversation we need to be having with people. And unfortunately, you're not going to have the data <laughs> today, right? Because the you know, you're looking at data from the last 90 days. Well, the, the next 90 days is going to be different data, right? So we need to be managing the seller's expectations of what does that look like, right? Um, that it that, that we may not get an offer in the first 24 hours. We may not get an offer for the first 30 days, and that's going to be okay, right? Because at the end of the day, real estate still sells, right? It still sells. And I think everyone just needs a minute to kind of catch up with what's happening. Um, at the bottom here, it says, don't overwhelm the seller with a 40-page CMA, right? Now, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. If you want to use something like RPR or Toolkit CMA, those are all great tools to have in there. They do make you look very professional. Just whichever you prefer to use, make sure you master it. 
and it speaks to who you are, right? Um, and, you know, 40 page CMA, I don't know that most people are even going to look at that, right? They just want to know bottom line, what are we, what are we going to get them for their house, right? Um, and so we want to, you know, have a complete set of pricing tools and we're going to go over what that looks like um, and being able to present that to them. Okay. And so again, changing your dialogue that I'm not going to do a listing presentation. I'm going to have a listing conversation because all of you are capable of sitting down with someone at their kitchen table and talking about the market, right. And geeking out about it. Uh, and then, and then helping them talk about, okay, what can we do to get your home sold? Okay. Um, and being unique and out of the box. I think that right now we need to, right. We need to, to, to dust off our old skills, Lisa, that in Tanya that we've had before in the past. Um, and, and Lee, <laughs> I'm thinking about, um, that. And I feel like that puts all of us OGs, if you will, kind of in a, in a, in an advantage, right. That we've, we've lived before and we've been through this. In fact, um, uh, workman's putting together a mastermind on how to navigate the changes that are happening. And I was like, Oh, put me on that list. <laughs> Been around a minute. I've seen some, seen some stuff. So, uh, so I think I love that they're doing that. So the only way to change the seller's perspective it, or, or perception is to involve them in the pricing, the pricing, uh, process. So looking at the first thing, the art of science. And so the leading the seller to the most appropriate price is your point. So having effective dialogue. So we definitely want to have your, your comps with you. And the, what we teach in this class is really basic comps, you guys. It's not overcomplicated. Um, and then we have leadership, right? And we have defining um, the the importance of definitions. Uh, so helping them to understand what is it that we're talking about, right? We tend to get into our jargon. Um, and then talking about the, the golden rule versus the platinum rule. Um, and then let's see, oops, I think I went too far. Um, leadership. So page nine. So teaching others how to think so that they will, they can do what they need to do to get what they claim that they want. And so most of the time sellers have two things, right? It's time and how much are they going to make? right? So the, the, how much are they going to make is important, right? Because maybe they're buying something else, they're relocating, and then time, maybe they need to be somewhere by a certain time. So um, I think it's important for us to, to figure out which is, what are those two, and then help them prioritize, uh, which is more important? Is it time or money? Okay. Um, all right. So the seven steps, what are the seven steps? No, y'all are dying to find out what the seven steps are. So, uh, and you see the little TM there. So seven step pricing strategy TM, uh, this supports a re relationship based approach and really that's kind of what we do, right? We're relationship makers. Uh, cause you know, if someone knows you, likes you and trusts you, then we should assume that they would do business with you. Right. And so step one is identifying, um, and identify and gain an understanding of the value ranges that exist in the neighborhood. And so we have, like I said, let's let's think about like uh, Sierra Verde, for example, over by the office in, in Glendale. You have different pockets in there, right? You've got Palomino, which is the gated area. You've got um, Siena, which is the smaller product. And then you have the Sabino, which is the larger product. And then Fulton's got their little product. And so you have these different little pockets that exist in one big master plan community. So you want to understand, you know, if you're pricing a house in Palomino that's got the little lake, it's going to be different than pricing something in Siena, which is the smaller, you know, smaller product, right? Um, and those properties were also a little bit more upgraded. So we want to know what exists in there. So getting in and digging in and finding out what's what's happening in this neighborhood. Um, we want to test the logic using expired listings. So check in and see, and I, I would say canceled too, um, not just expireds. Um, and then step three is determining the value ranges most suited for the home. So that might be, you know, 325 to 350, or I guess I should use better numbers, <laughs> 400 to 425, let's say something like that. Uh, and then strategic, strategically positioning the home within that value range. That's step four. So um, I had a, a client of mine, this was a few years ago. It was a house in Moon Valley. And I think, I think we were priced at between 325 and 350. It's been a minute since that house sold, uh, which was a lot of money because they had they had bought it for like 180. Uh, and so when I went to the property to, to talk to them, I already knew in my head 325 to 350 was the range, and I wanted them to list it at 330. And so I had price. I ran cost sheets for each of those price ranges. And as we went through the listings and we talked about the amenities, and then they had highly upgraded this house. Um, they actually said, "Well, how do we? Do you think 330 is a good start place?" to start. And I said, that's exactly what I was thinking. And so we want to figure out what that range is, right? And then where do we place that home in that range? Their house was highly upgraded. So I was okay, you know, putting it at the higher end of the range because of all the stuff that had been done to it. If it had been in, in, in its original state, it would have been more in the 300 or closer to the 325. Okay. So we got to know that and don't be afraid you guys to go on a two-part listing appointment. 
if that home's been highly upgraded or it's something unique or it's you know got land or whatever, don't be afraid to do a two-step. Go look at the property first and then come back and do your comps because sometimes we do need to lay eyes on something before we can get in and really say, okay, this is what this is what to do in with the comps. Okay. Um, so don't be afraid to do that. Uh, and then step five is verify the price position that satisfies the seller's financial needs, making sure that that's going to net them. I don't think we have really too many sellers that are upside down. I think there might still some, be some out there, but not very many. Uh, step six is analyze all the homes directly competing with the property. So what's active? And I think um, probably need to pay attention to new builds, right? If there's new construction near or around um, the subject property, because new construction can be a little bit of a, especially if there's going to be spec inventory coming back on the market and, and new homes kind of change in there, going back to pre, pre-pandemic uh, ways that we would sell new construction. Um, and then step seven is determining the most appropriate price entry point based on the time, the timing need of the seller. So, and again, we are going to be challenged, you guys running comps for the next, I would say the next 60 to 90 days, uh, because the market has to catch up and all the data that you're looking at is pre interest rates going up. And so I think we have to have those conversations with sellers and just being honest that, you know, I don't have a crystal ball right now. Um, and then, you know, it is summertime and, and you know, we're, summertime tends to be a little bit wonky, can be, and July can be especially wonky because, and everybody in Arizona wants to leave Arizona in July because it's so hot. So, and a lot of people are on vacation and, and getting ready for going back to school. So I think we have to be, we have to manage people's expectations right now that we simply, in my opinion, we just don't have the data, right? We don't have the data yet because the market has to catch up. Um, so on page 10, so the seven step pricing strategy will not reveal a different, different end price that's a typical CMA. It will, however, allow the seller a better opportunity to self-discover the most appropriate price or most appropriate in price, which results in fewer objections and more win-win relationships. And so going through each of these steps, we're going to dig in a little bit, a little bit more here um, on the next page. Uh, so again, our job is just to discover why did that house sell? Investigate that. Why did it, why did a property sell? Um, and so step one. So we need to look at the high, the high range, the low range, and the mid range, right, for the neighborhood. So I want to get in again, dig in there and find out what's going on in that neighborhood. Um, and then on page 11, so what do we want to look at? We want to look at the most important things, number of bedrooms, <clears throat> the, is it a two-story versus a single story or basement, uh, how many square feet, the year built, if it has a pool or not, and a lot description. Those are the things that are the most important things for buyers. And so that's what we want to use for data. Okay. So we want to try to compare as close as we can apples to apples. Um, if you're looking at stuff that's a master plan community, you should be able to go into the subdivision and identify the square footage and then look for other model matches uh, to that property because those are the best comps, right? If you can find a model match. Okay. Um, and so we want to look at the bedrooms, two story versus the single story, square footage, year built if it has a pool or not, and your lot description. Okay, so those, again, are the six key buying features that are, I guess I should do six, uh, <laughs> six uh, features that um, buyers are looking for. So we want to be looking at that for MLS or for our CMAs. So step two, looking at expireds, right? Going in and checking to see what expired and canceled. And so this is what the market has rejected. And that's a very specific word because nobody wants to be rejected, right? It reminds you of the high school dance that you were terrified to go to. And so we want to make sure we're, we're languaging that because it's very jarring to a seller that these are the homes that were, were rejected by buyers in the marketplace. And so that's very specific languaging. Um, I think, you know, in MLS, you guys can do a search you can set it up where you can see um, how many times that home has been has been um, sent out in, in saved searches. Has it been favorited by consumers looking at it or has it been rejected? And that's really good information because, you know, that's where people start their home buying searches online. So if you could provide the seller with, with that report to say, hey, you know, Lenny, your house has been viewed a thousand times and it's been hearted X number and rejected X number, right? So that's also good. That's all, it's not a showing, but it's kind of like a showing, right? Because they're looking at it and if they're rejecting it before they even, you know, decide that they want to go see it. So powerful information. Uh, that uh, uh, AdWorks, you guys, make sure too, you're putting your seller's information there because it sends them the report and sends you a report too. They're kind of obnoxious with their upsell, I do have to say, but <laughs> but they do a good job for the first seven, first seven days. Um, and then step three is... Um, we know we need to know why. So we've identified what the value ranges are, but why do they exist? Um, and then what is the range most suited for your subject property? So is it in the is it the high end, the middle, or the low? Okay. 
And again, if you haven't been to the home and you don't know anything about it, that might be where it's important to, you know, go take a look at it so you can figure out where does it fall into that range, right? Um, and especially if you're doing luxury, you know, luxury market, that, that's a whole other bag. So I would definitely encourage you to do a two-step on, on those types of properties. So step four. So we want to have the value range. Um, this says $10 per square foot. I think the information is dated because um, nothing's selling for $10 per square foot. And in fact, I don't even really like to do a per square foot. That's something we did 25 years ago. Um, and I don't think it's relevant in today's market. I think it's relevant to some degree, but even appraisers don't use that. So um, I think the materials are dated here. So let's not, uh, <laughs> not talk about a, a per square foot uh, pricing. So, um, but I think we do need to know, we need to study the amenities and the condition of the home to compare it to the solds, right? This is step four is, is what's sold in the neighborhood and why did it sell? And again, we got to go to that, that financing section and look and see what's doing there as far as, you know, can it go FHA? Um, you know, maybe we might start, start seeing some more FHA loans getting accepted and VA loans getting accepted. So paying attention to that and definitely paying attention to concessions, okay? Because I think concessions are going to come back really fast, and I think we need to be managing sellers' expectations on what are those concessions? What do they look like, right? Um, and you guys, some of you heard me say this last week and in the BAM Mastermind, please get with your lenders and have a conversation about what are the options out there? What does it cost to buy down a rate? Um, I talked to a, a girl I coach that's on a team and she's personally buying a home and she's shelling out $8,500 to buy down her rate. That's significant. That's a big chunk of money, right? $8,500. And so um, I think I have that conversation with your lenders. What are the three, two ones out there? Um, what are options? Debbie, Debbie Parkins was blowing some minds last, last week in the BAM uh, mastermind. She was talking about, she was trying to structure a deal on a listing that she has doing an 80-10-10. How many of you have heard of an 80-10-10 in the last five years? 10 years, right? We haven't been doing them. So Lenny, for your, for your education, it's 80%. They were putting 10% down and the seller was going to carry 10% for a period of time. And so that, that was how she was trying to structure that deal, which I found fascinating that that's, that type of thing is already happening that quickly. Okay. So uh, I get with your lenders and find out what are the options out there, right? We need to be versed in that so we can have educated conversations with people. And also being able to convey that to a seller, right? What are they going to be expecting? Okay. Step five um, is verify that the pricing position satisfies the seller's needs. So making sure that, you know, you got, you got to ask them. I ask before I even go to the appointment, what do you owe on the property? Do you have more than one mortgage? Right. And that's still a question we need to be asking. Um, I need to know that because that's going to change how I, how I look at my comps. Right. And most sellers, and I, and I'm going to ask the question too, what do you think your house is worth? And if they say to me, well, Tanya, that's why I'm calling you. Okay. Now I know I'm probably dealing with the D personality, um, but most people are going to be amical and say, oh, Monica, I was on you know, Zillow and Zillow said X, or I went on Redfin, I, Redfin said X, right? Or we'd really like to get this because we're, we, we're, we're moving across the country, right? And so I always ask that question because now I know before I get there, I'm not going to be blindsided, right? And I can see with the data, does that support what they're actually thinking or not, right? Um, so we want to know that. Plus, I like I said, I do cost sheets. Um, and so because, again, what are the two things that people want to know? How much money am I making and how long is it going to take to get there? And so I, as an agent, I need to be able to sit down with the seller and say, here's what you're going to net. And so I want to do a cost sheet. And again, it's a closing technique for me is if I have three prepared and those, those ranges that I want, and it's the 330 price that I want them to have, if I've got that cost sheet all ready to go, it helps me close the, the, close the deal that much faster. Okay. So not only is it important that we do it because we need to be able to tell the seller what they're going to net, but you can also use it as a tool to help, um, you know, the, the conversion of that conversation. Uh, let's see. Step six um, is to analyze the homes that are competing. So what's active on the market. And so um, we can talk about that already. Step seven is to determine the appropriate price entry point based on timing needs. And so, um, Oh, what was I going to say? I had a thought and that just completely jumped out of my head. Um, shoot. What was it I was going to say, you guys? I'm having a blonde moment at the moment. Uh, so the timing needs. So again, looking at what's what's happened in the past, how long have, have, have houses sat on the market, what's competing with us and what's happening. And, you know, sometimes on step seven, um, you can actually, or, or I'm sorry, step six, I would, if the house is vacant and we have a comp, go take that person to the property, let them see it, right? If it's vacant, 
go take them, right? And then they can see Tanya, well, yeah, my house is not as nice as this house, right? Or this house, whatever, right? So they can actually get in there and feel the property, right? So that's another, another conversion tool that we have. Uh, let's see, step seven. All right, um, let me just skip forward here. Sure, I'm getting close on time. So, um, all right, so recap here. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So this is basically talking about on the previous slide, it mentions right here, two to three properties that are similar. So when you look at an appraisal, an appraiser, appraiser is going to look at three active and three sold, right? And so that's what we want to aim for too, and not, not overwhelming the seller with a whole bunch of data. Now, I also like to look at the whole entire neighborhood um, because I don't want to go into that appointment and be blindsidedly where they say, well, the neighbor's house sold for X. And I think Bob kind of mentioned this too, is neighbor's house sold for X. I don't have it in my comps because maybe it's a two-story or it's a much bigger home or a much smaller home. I don't have it in my comps. So that's now throwing me off my game, right? So I want to look at the whole neighborhood, print out the one-liner so that I have that available. So if they mention Jim and Sally's house that's sold next door and it's not in my comps, I can say, well, Tanya, I wouldn't use that as a comp because it's a two-story home or it's significantly bigger or whatever the reason is that I didn't use it for my comps. But I think that's important too. Um, the other thing is you guys preview. If you're going on a listing appointment and there's some vacant homes around there or even even occupied go preview um get in there and take a look at them and see what's happening because that also helps you um i years ago i took a class um a writing class and the assignment was to write a story about going to the circus and when i got my assignment back the instructor said have you ever been to the circus and i said no and he goes well it's obvious in your story because you can't write a story about going to the circus if you've never been to the circus and so if you don't go out and preview and you don't know what's going on with trends and things that are happening um, in the marketplace it you, we can't be a pricing strategist so go out look at the new construction preview right but before you go on an appointment drive around the neighborhood see what's going on find out what's what's happening in the neighborhood is there a park is there a school what are the values that are there but again, it's our job to investigate why properties sell and then present that information to the seller, okay? Um, so lastly here, just to recap, and then we'll, uh, we'll come off mute and have a dialogue here, but identify and understand the ranges, right, on the solds. We want to test the understanding based on what has happened in the past, right? Properties that have either canceled or expired. And then what's the range? Where do we place that home in the range? Um, and then how do we how do we do that based on the seller's, the seller's uh, financial needs and their timing needs? And sometimes those change, right? I shared a story with you guys about a little guy named Jason that was all about the, the price at the beginning. So I told him I could get him five grand more than he was thinking he could get. And he was all about that. But then seven days later, he was, you know, by himself, his family's gone, his pets are gone. He's never been away from his kid. Seven days later, he's like, I don't care about the five grand. I need to be with my family. We did get him the five grand. Uh, and so we did get it. But he, it was a great story of a real life thing that happened to me uh, that I can share with you that, that in the beginning, his perspective was all about how much money he was going to make. And seven days later, this man who was all jacked up about getting to sit in his underwear and play video games and drink beer and be a bachelor was a, an emotional mess because he missed his family and it was no longer about the money, right? And so we had to pay attention to those signs. And I think Monica, Roberta shared with me yesterday that one of your listings that the seller actually called you to reduce the price. And so if you got any input on that, I'd love to hear it because I think that's an, a great story that if a seller picks up the phone and says, hey, you know, we need to reduce the price, right? You got, can you share a little bit more about that, Monica? Yeah, we, we were, cause I send them what's happening around them. And if they call me first and go, did you see this? Then it's too late. And I'm like, Oh, I did see that. And the background is she is the estate um, holder helping her parents and her husband is an agent. Mm -hmm. So the reality is there partly, but then the three days later, they wanted to change up all the photos reduced by, you know, 75% and then, uh, wanted to see as a new listing and that's going to help. And then crickets. So it's just they're Yes, they're great. And then they're in a panic mode. And I said, remember when we first started before this rush of interest rate, um, challenge going on, I said, we talked about 21 days on market. So, I said, just take a deep breath and then we need to, you know, see how this goes and the market will tell us, but yes, they were, they were great with the, with the price reduction and loved it. It's still right. on, it's still getting online activity, but crickets with showings. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's well, a great price. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, sit it open, have an open house. Um, uh, we, zero people through my open house. Oh, that's so. right. Roberta said so, but, but I gave Roberta some ideas yesterday. She's going to share with you. So, okay. Um, yeah. So Lisa, you got a buyer looking at a 10 year arm. That's fascinating. Yes. Yeah, so the one that I told you about, um, it's priced, it is priced higher. I mean, they're priced lowest in the neighborhood. It's a, it's a townhome here in Goodyear. Mm-hmm. And they're priced lower, lowest in the neighborhood, but they're still overpriced. Like I had mentioned earlier about yeah. um, what the price comps were. Anyway, um, so she was doing conventional and she was able to put 15% down. So she's in a good position, but you know, once the interest rates started going up, she started getting really nervous. So the lender is like, Hey, I can get you in like the last increase, she was going to be like at 6.25, but with a 10 year arm, she was going to be able to go in at 5.75. Okay. And, you know, she'll be able to refi within that 10 year period. Yeah. They're saying that by that this, the, what I have read and um, I actually listened to an interview was a a thing on CNN the other day. And the interviewer was kind of, I mean, she was kind of giving it to the, the, the representative from, from the fed. And of course, you know, being true to politics, she kind of danced around the questions, but the two (laughs) questions that the interviewer said was why did it take the fed so long? And did you go too far? And so, you know, again, true to form, what do we do? We swing the pendulum way far over here, right? And so, yeah. uh, you know, hopefully, I, I'm hoping that the feds will give this a minute to, to, to course correct before they jack the rates again. So, because sure. there's speculation, they're going to do it again, like soon. So mm-hmm. it's all going to depend on, because well, the lady at the, at the Fed was saying that the goal is to get inflation back down to 2%. And we're at 8.6 nationally. And I think Arizona might be slightly higher than that. So, um, but yeah, pay attention to that stuff, you guys. So 10 year arm, that's fascinating. So, um, but it does make a difference in payment, right? It does. Yeah. So, and everything I'm reading is the market through 2023 could continue to be a little bit volatile with rates. So, um, so I think we gotta, you know, be educated. It's still going to happen. People are still going to buy and sell. We just need a minute to catch up and wrap our brains around what's happening right now. So, um, any other questions, comments, or thoughts? So I would encourage all of you guys, uh, to, for the next 30 days, post something positive on your social media outlets about real estate or home ownership. Um, I think the more that we can flood the market with positivity, the better it will be uh, for everyone involved. And so whether that's a funny meme or, you know, Remax just posted a great that we are Remax great stat about how we are still, what was it? I'll, I, I downloaded it because that's going to be my my post today. If you guys got any closings, you know, anything like that, that you guys can post. So this was Remax, the We Are Remax site put being number one, never gets old. Remax teams are the most productive among major brands based on the average size per agent. And so I love that being number one never gets old. So, um, and I also found this amazingly hideous picture on social media. That's a lovely kitchen covered in wallpaper, which is going to make a great post. And so let's all find something positive. You guys have Photofy, you've got Remax Hustle, that Remax Collaborative Share Inspire Facebook page puts out great content. So I would challenge all of you for the next 30 days, every day, put something positive out um, about home ownership or what's something positive about the market. Okay. Let's let's swing that pendulum the other way and keep the negativity at bay. <laughs> so with that being said, um, I think we have, do we have a class on Wednesday with Alex? I don't remember if we do or not. Um, so we might have a class on Wednesday. And then of course, if you're doing BAM, um, we got BAM on Thursday. So, uh, and that being said, you guys, if you have any questions, comments, anything that you need from me, please reach out. I'm always a resource for you guys. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Have a great bye, day. Guys. All right. Bye. Bye. bye.